Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. The title of today's message is Enoch Walked with God, and we're going to be looking at two different passages. One of them is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, and the other one is Genesis chapter 5, verses 18 through 24, which is the actual story about Enoch in the Old Testament. So I'm going to ask as we begin here that in honor of the, the reading of God's word, if you would please stand. And I'm going to be reading Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7, and I'm using the King James Version. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. And then we hit today's passage. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Thank you. You may be seated. As we're working through the book of Hebrews, we've come to Hebrews chapter 11. And the popular name for that book is the, the chapter of the heroes of the faith, or the heroes of the faith chapter. And so everything the writer of Hebrews has been telling us all along, now he really begins to focus on bringing it out with examples of individuals who lived out this faith in the Old Testament. Last week we looked at the story of Abel. This week we're going to pick it up with the story of, of Enoch. Warren Wiersbe says, faith simply means doing God's will in spite of feelings, circumstances, or consequences. Let me read that again. Faith simply means doing God's will in spite of feelings, circumstances, and consequences. Sometimes when we're totally devoted to following God, we realize that stepping forward and taking a stand for God is going to leave us to have to suffer some consequences, isn't it? And one of those individuals we see who had to go through, through some of that was Enoch. Charles Spurgeon said, perhaps the only way in which most men have their faith increased is by great trouble. We don't grow strong in faith on sunshiny days. It is only through rough weather that a man gets faith. Faith is not an attainment that drops like a great dew from heaven. It generally comes in the whirlwind of the storm. Do you realize that you are who you are today because of the experiences that you've gone through in your life? In fact, it's how you've handled those experiences that really brings out the person that you are. And, and for spiritual growth, I don't know why it is this way, but God has dying, designed uh, persecution and difficult times as a means of helping us accelerate our spiritual growth, which is exactly what Charles Spurgeon picked up on here. And when we look at the individual Enoch, he lived in a very difficult time. This was the pre-flood world that we find out in Genesis chapter 6 was so violent, it was so vile, if you would, that God was going to destroy the entire world with the exception of eight individuals and a few animals that were on Noah's Ark. And so that's the world that Enoch lived in at this time. And that's the world that he had to live out his faith. Now some of you in your jobs and in your families are in difficult circumstances to live out your Christian faith. And it takes a great deal of devotion to God 
and a love for God to do that no matter what it is that you have to face from those individuals, no matter what kind of consequences end up coming back to you. And so we're going to start off today in Hebrews chapter 11 in that great chapter of the heroes of the faith in verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In the Old Testament, I've come to find out that sometimes as we're reading through, we'll see the same names over and over again. People would name uh, their children names after other, other characters that we find in the Bible. And I was thinking back in 1955 when I was born, uh, my parents, of course, named me Michael. And I was wondering, what were the most popular names back in 1955? And I looked it up and I thought it was going to be Michael and John. And that's my middle name too. <laughs> but, but when I looked it up, it was Michael and David. So I started thinking, I, I wonder what the most popular names in 2017 are. Well, let's, let's back up first to 2016. Do you realize the most popular name for a boy in 2016 was the name Ezra? The most popular name for a boy in 2017 is the name Asher. Now you hear Asher and, and, and you start thinking about that name, but do you realize Asher was one of the sons of Jacob? Do you realize Asher is one of the 12 tribes of Israel? Do you see a common denominator in the names that are chosen as the most popular names in the United States, be it 1955 or 2017? What's that common denominator? They're all biblical names, right? And even back in the days of Enoch, you can get really confused reading through the book of Genesis. Because if you get into Genesis chapter 4, you're going to see that there's an Enoch mention, there's a Lamech, uh, Lamech mention. And uh, what we find out is that these individuals actually were not who we're reading about today. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 17, it says this, it says, And Cain knew his wife. Now, you remember the story last week? We, we had Cain and Abel, right? And Cain goes ahead, he murders Abel. He, he goes ahead and heads on out. He's a, a vagabond at this point, wandering all over the place. And, and now we see Cain coming back into the story here, and he's got a wife. And it says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and she bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And so the name Enoch in the city Enoch is not the Enoch that we're talking about today. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad uh, begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. Now, the Enoch in chapter 5 is the seventh from Adam, where the Enoch in, in chapter 4 is the third from Adam. And the Lamech in chapter 5 actually turns out to be the father of, of Noah. And so what we see here is that you had the evil line of Cain, and that's the line that's mentioned first. So if you're reading through, don't get confused. If you go to chapter 5, you see the godly line of Seth, and that's where we're picking up the names of the character that we're looking at today. Well, Enoch was, he, he was a man who lived in the evil and an idolatrous generation, much like today. Uh, the people were ungodly. They did what they wanted to do. They did not want to worship the God of the Bible. But the one thing that we learn is that the Enoch of Genesis chapter 5 lived a life in such a way that he pleased God, in such a way that he walked with God. You see, the name Enoch means dedicated. And this Enoch was truly dedicated to God. He was dedicated to living his life for him. And God, in his mercy, caught up Enoch. We might call it raptured up Enoch. And he never experienced death. He's one of only two people that, that have never done that. In fact, perhaps Enoch foreshadowed the rapture of the church. Verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We learned two truths in this. Number one, we learned that without genuine faith, it is absolutely impossible to please God. Now, what does that tell you about all the unbelievers in the world? Do they have genuine faith? No. In fact, we see that played out here in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Whoa, wait a minute. The carnal mind or the fleshly mind is enmity. It is at war against God. So wait a minute, I'm not at war against God. What are you talking about? If you haven't received Christ as Lord and Savior, believe it or not, you're fighting God. And it says the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be so. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So number one, without genuine faith, it is impossible to please God. Number two, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I was reading you know, on, on the internet, and I, I, I cannot believe this. Have you looked at the salaries today that some of the NBA players are getting? James Harden just signed the, the contract, which is the largest contract in the history of the NBA for four years of work. You ready for this? $228 million. I'm thinking, whoa. But the word diligent, what does that mean to you? Diligent means that you're going to work really hard at it. If you're going to be diligent at your job, you are working really hard at your job, aren't you? You're doing the very best that you can. Now, can you imagine the basketball player? And today we see all kinds of basketball players that are just working like crazy, trying to be one of the few who ends up in the NBA. But if you've got somebody who watches it on TV and they want that $228 million, they're going to be watching it on TV here and not practicing. You think they're ever going to get on there? You think they're ever going to excel in the sport? I don't think so. I think if they want to excel in the sport, they need to get out there and buy the hours. They are shooting. They are running. They are getting everything ready. Now, I'd like to compare that for just a moment to you and me. If we're going to be diligent in our faith to God, if we're going to be diligent in our Christian walk, we go home, we just kick back on our chairs, and we sit there, and we just let it all happen. Is that right? Or are we out there preparing so that we're ready, that when that opportunity comes to go out and share with other people, that we are prepared and we can do the very best that we can do for the Lord? Well, we know that Enoch's faith faith was genuine and his walk of faith was one that pleased God. I got to tell you, one of the things that absolutely drives me nuts today is the common title that we're hearing in so many different places is when they talk about an individual to say that individual is a person of faith. You hear it all the time, don't you? What does that tell you about that individual's spiritual walk with the God of the Bible? Doesn't tell you a thing. They are a person of faith. Does that mean that they've got the faith to know that they go out and they start their car and their car is going to run? Or is that faith in, in the sun God? It doesn't tell us anything. The kind of faith that pleases God is a, a faith that relies completely upon him. And you know, we look at our Bibles today, and so often people go out and they, they believe in God, but yeah, what, what God do you believe in? I don't know how many times that I've, I've heard people say that. You go out and talk to them, they show no signs of being a believer. And they'll tell you, I believe in a God, and I just want to say, good. Don't you realize that just believing that God exists qualifies you to be a demon? Look at James, look at James chapter 2. You believe that there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe that. But you see the last part of that verse? And they tremble. At least demons have the, the common sense to tremble in the presence of God, even if they don't have saving faith. You see, a person's faith is only as good as the object of his or her faith. And today, like Enoch, so often, Enoch's day, so often, people prefer to have a God of their own image. How many times have you heard of, well, I I believe in God. Oh, but I don't don't believe in all that stuff in the Bible. A hell? A literal hell? Really? I don't believe in all that stuff. People want to have a God in their own image. And yet we find out that God created us in whose image? In his image. And he gave us his word. And we need to be prepared to conform our lives to him. Well, today's salvation comes only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It seems like the most popular concept of salvation today is that we're saved by death. All we have to do is die. You just listen to people. They they, they die and everybody's going to heaven. As soon as they die, that's the path to going to heaven. That is not what Jesus taught us. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one 
comes to the Father except through me. We see in, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, that Jesus tells us there's only one way to heaven. In fact, it's a narrow way. In, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And if you find it. See, so often people today say, look, uh, just, you just have to believe. And I want to say, have to believe in what? We have to believe in Christ. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus didn't say to enter in through the wide gate. Jesus said it's a narrow gate, that there's only one way, that he's the way to salvation. And apart from Jesus Christ, it's a lie. We need to have true faith. It's not enough to believe that there's a God because even the demons believe that there's a God. But we need to put our trust in the God of the Bible. Not of our own making, not of our imagination, but the God of the Bible. Well, we find the story of Enoch as it picks up in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, chapter five. I'm going to encourage you to turn your Bibles over there if you would. And as we look at this, at the end of chapter 4, we see the genealogy of, of Cain. And it's the ungodly line, but as we come into Genesis chapter 5, we end up coming into the godly genealogy of Seth. And I'm going to go ahead and read through here. I'm going to be emphasizing on, on a few words here, and you'll be able to catch what I'm talking about here in just a moment. Genesis chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and call, called them mankind in the day in which they were created. And Adam lived 130 years, and he begot his son in his own likeness, in, after his image, and he named him Seth. So, once again, we're into the godly line of Seth now. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years. And he had sons and daughters, so that all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Listen to those words. Seth lived 105 years, and he begot Enosh. And he begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years. And he had sons, and he had daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And after he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 800 years, 815 years, and had sons and daughters, so that all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Do you see a pattern there? Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahaliel. After he begot Mahaliel, Canaan lived 840 40 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared. And after he begot Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahaliel were 895 days, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had some sons and daughters. So that all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Getting a little old, isn't it? They're born, they live for a while, quite a while, and then they die. But as we come into the text in Genesis chapter 5, verses 18 through 24, we find something very different. There's a shift in what happens, and all of a sudden, we get a glimmer of hope. I'm going to go back to verse 18 and start with that. And it says, Jared, who's the father of Enoch. This is, this is where we pick up the story of Enoch right here. Jared lived 162 years, and he begot Enoch. Maybe there's some of you in here that have had children at 50 or 60 years old, and you think, man, I'm kind of old to have a child, right? Can you imagine having a child at 162 years old? And it's like, wow, <laughs> 162, and he ends up having, having this child, and his family's just starting. Verse 19, after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years, and he had sons, and he had daughters. We look at that, and we say, wow. He lived an incredibly long lifespan. 
Is it possible that the Bible made a mistake? I mean, you look at the ages here. You've got individuals living 912 years, 930 years, 969 years. Is it possible that the Bible made a mistake? No, absolutely not. Well, how do you account for that? How is it that before the flood, people lived incredibly long periods of time? We don't live that today. If we live to be 80 years old, we're happy. Well, maybe not some of you. <laughs> okay, so if we live to be 100 years old, we're happy. But 900? Really? Well, there's a couple of reasons as to why that may have been. You see, apparently the human body was pure genetically at the beginning of time. Why would I say that? Because Adam and Eve were created in perfection. They were created to live forever. But when sin came into the world, they began to die. They died spiritually immediately, but later on they died physically. And there's a slower process in which you see them dying. All the interbreeding and everything else was just beginning at this particular point, And the lifespan seems to be really, really long. But there may be another reason. Oops, there we go. Let me go back. Uh, many believe that a canopy of water surrounded the earth protecting its inhabitants from harmful ultraviolet rays. It was a canopy that they believe uh, that was released in Noah's day causing the worldwide flood. Now let me talk about that for just a moment. Okay, I want you to just gr grasp that for a minute. Many people believe that in the beginning of time the earth was surrounded by a canopy that was of water. We see in the early chapters of Genesis that the water came up from the ground. Some people would say that there's never been any rain, but I would suspect that there had been because even within the garden we see that there were four rivers. And those four rivers had water that was flowing all the time. But it's possible even that was coming up from within. Now, I was reading online the other day that Mount Eret in Turkey is over 16,000 feet high. That is a high mountain. And when the flood came, we find that the, and by the way, that's the mountain that the ark ended up resting on. When the flood came, we find that the floodwaters rose higher than the highest mountains in the world. Now, it's possible that back in those days, Mount Eret wasn't that high. Why would I say that? Well, it's possible because we look at mountains like Mount St. Helens, and they said, oh, it's going to take so many thousand years for it to rise up this high after it blew, and we see that, that that's moving pretty quickly. But the fact is, is that that mountain was going up. But I want you to think about this for a minute. What would cause a worldwide flood that instantly would happen and cover all of the mountains in the world? Imagine if the entire earth were surrounded by a canopy of water, and God in his judgment at once released that. And that's what many people believe caused the, the worldwide flood just to come, boom, like that in 40 days and 40 nights. Hey, I live in Oregon. I've had 40 days and 40 nights of rain here. And you have too. But, <laughs> but for it to come down like that, if that, that canopy came down, you can see how that would, would cover the, the entire earth very quickly. Verse 20. All the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. You see, in the story of Enoch, we find a welcome break from the words, and he died, because in Enoch's case, Enoch never ends up dying. Methuselah died at an older age than Jared, 969 years old, which was seven years older. Jared was uh, 962. But I can't say that, that Methuselah lived longer than anyone else in the history of the world, and I don't think you can either. Because Enoch has never died. Enoch's still alive. So he's, we, we can't say that he's died. He's still alive, but he was caught up to be with the Lord. Verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah. Now, the birth of Methuselah was a turning point in Enoch's life. And we're going to see that in verse 22, because we find from the time of that birth, all of a sudden that becomes the counting time for the amount of years that, that he had left to walk on this planet. But we have to ask what happened. Did trying to raise a godly son in a godless society force Enoch to lean on God? Maybe you've gone through that with your own children. Boy, you're trying to raise your kids. It is so hard. You're leaning on God like never before because of all of the challenges with your children. Did God, and this is interesting, did God warn Enoch of impending judgment following the birth of his son? 
In Jude 14 and 15, and I say that because there's only one chapter in, in Jude, so there's no chapter number. In Jude verses 14 and 15, Enoch is clearly seen warning people and prophesying about the ultimate judgment that would come in Christ. You see, Enoch was a prophet of God. And it says in Jude 14 verses, or Jude verses 14 and 15, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, and of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I want you to know the significance of that. Enoch is back in the Old Testament before the flood. And now we find out that Enoch in that society that was so violent, that was so anti-God, was out there and he is, he is prophesying to them. He's telling them the Lord's going to come with his tens of thousands. Now Jude quotes from a book which is called the book of Enoch. I've got it and I went ahead and read through it and there's a little section in this chapter. In fact, in chapter 2, this is the whole chapter and this is what it says. Behold, he comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon them, destroy the wicked, reprove all the flesh for everything which the sinful and ungodly have done and committed against him. And I looked at this book and I looked at what Jude put. And I wonder, okay, somehow God has spoken to Enoch. He's given him a vision that judgment is coming. In fact, it's coming soon. It may very well be possible that Enoch was looking ahead and he was initially seeing the flood that would come during the days of Noah. However, when Jude takes this passage, he goes ahead and he quotes it up there and he says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Jude acknowledges that this will be Jesus and ultimately the prophecy that Enoch has points towards the second coming of Jesus. That brings up a problem. I don't know if you caught that. I'm reading from a book called the book of Enoch. Is the book of Enoch in the Bible? No. In fact, uh, should the book of Enoch be in the Bible? Some people would say, well, Jude's quoting them. And I would say, no. The majority of people believe that this book here was actually written between 300 and 100 BC, somewhere in that area. Now, if it was in fact written before the flood, what problem does that bring up? How did it get through the flood? Did Noah end up taking it on the ark? I, I don't think so. But we see that, that Jude quotes from this book. Are there times when Bible writers will quote from books that aren't in Scripture when there's a truth within that book that the Holy Spirit says, put in that book? Yeah. How do we know that this statement from Jude is 100% accurate? Because the Bible's ultimate writer is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, put it in this book. Now, are there ever times out there in which we find, find others that are quoting other books? And, and I've got to say absolutely yes. And by the way, before I go on from the book of Enoch, there's a, an interesting thing in here. When you read through the Bible, you find out that there's one archangel. Who is that one archangel? Michael. Michael. That's it. Some people have tried to say Gabriel. But when you read through, through the book of Enoch, what you find out is it lists four archangels. It lists Michael, Raphael, Gabriel and Phanel. And, and that part, we've we got to go with the scriptures. The scriptures alone are the authority for what we believe. Isn't that right? So we've got one archangel. We've got Michael. But Jude, in a similar way, quotes from another book that's not in the Bible, in his book. We see in Jude verses 8 and 9, it says, Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. Have you read that in the book of Jude? Absolutely. What was Jude quoting from? Well, we've got a lost book which was called The Assumption of Moses. And so that's the particular book that he was quoting from here, which brings up the problem again. Does that mean that we should take that book, The Assumption of Moses, and include it in the Bible? And I would say absolutely not. 
But we see that biblical writers will take truths that are in the writings of other people and they will pull them in and they will present that uh, within the Word of God. Let me give you one last example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Paul writes these words, Bad company corrupts good character. Now these words were taken from the word of Menander, who was a Greek poet. He, they were in his writings that he had put down. Paul was familiar with them, and he pulls out these words, and he put them in there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You can take sentences, the biblical writers would take sentences that are accurate, and they would put them into the, the Word of God, and so there's nothing out of line in this. Well, something changed radically in Enoch's life, and it may have been the, the revelation of God's judgment that was coming. Perhaps God told Enoch at the birth of Methuselah that he was about to destroy the world because Enoch's life changed immediately. You know, realizing that judgment is coming should change everyone's life. It should change our life. We know today that judgment is coming in the future. It should change the way in which we live our lives. As an interesting footnote, we find out that the year Methuselah died, you ready for this? The flood came. So it's very possible because we see Enoch actively out there prophesying and warning people to get their lives right with the Lord because he's coming back. Well, Peter gives us a similar warning today about the end times, but this time it won't be a flood. This time it will be something very different. First, Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and, and, and the works that are in it will be burned up. This time the world won't be destroyed by a flood. This time the world will be destroyed by fire. I got to tell you, it sure bugs me when I see one of the most beautiful signs that God has ever given to us taken and used for things that are absolutely contrary to God's word. You see, God gave us the rainbow as a beautiful sign that God will never destroy the world again by flood. And we look at that. He gives signs for everything. The sign of the old covenant was circumcision. And you'll see signs for different, the signs of the new covenant uh, we see is, is, is the, the very blood of Christ. It's the Lord's Supper. It's, it's communion. Well, in verses 11 and 12, it says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for the hastening of looking for and hastening the coming day. I was watching a Billy Graham crusade one time years ago when he was preaching, and he was focusing on this past passage and particularly on the last part of it, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my goodness, so we're to live holy and that brings the Lord back sooner. We want to reach these individuals. But what I missed in all of this is what it says in front of that. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You see, in Enoch's life, when his son was born, somehow when he found out that the judgment of God was coming, it changed him forever. He walked with God in such a way that it pleased God. And ladies and gentlemen, we know that the judgment of God is coming and could come any time. And for each and every one of us, it should change our lives so that when we're out there living and walking, that, that we're walking in holiness, we're hot, walking in righteousness, trying to reach as many people as we can for Christ. Verse 22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, and he had sons and daughters. You see, the birth of Methuselah was a turning point in Enoch's life. And we see in verse 22 that that started the timetable of 300 years here. Having children changed Enoch's life. I've got to ask you, having children, has it changed your life? Yeah, I, I hope it has. I've often said that God has given us children to teach us to pray. Amen? So, but the thing is, is, we find that we become more dependent upon God because it's such a big responsibility to take our kids and to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And we want to be dependent upon God. We want to see our kids walking with God more than anything. Well, only one other person in the Old Testament is said to have walked with God. And we find that that's Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Some people would say, well, what about Abraham? Didn't Abraham walk with God? 
Well, what the Bible says there is that Abraham walks before God, but it doesn't say that he walked with God. Only Enoch and, and Noah are the only two that are given that title. But they walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? It means that we live our lives in such a way that it's pleasing to God. How can we get a better walk with God? Well, one thing is, is that we need to be completely devoted to Him. We need to be committed to following the Lord, no matter what, no matter what the consequences are. But we need to spend time in God's Word. We need to spend time in prayer, not because of legalism or ritual. We need to do it out of love, that we want to get to know Him more deeply. We want to get to know Him more intimately. Verse 23, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Seems like a long time, doesn't it? 365 years? Until you start comparing it to the lifespans of the other people who are mentioned in Genesis chapter 5. Adam, 930 years. Seth, 912 years. Enish, 905 years. Canaan, 910 years. Mahaliel, 895 years. Jared, 962 years. Enoch, 365? But then he was caught up to heaven. Perhaps a picture of the rapture, and he never died. Verse 24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. If you look at the Hebrew meaning for the word walked in this, we find out that he had a close, intimate relationship with God that was continually growing. And for each and every one of us, we never arrive in this planet. I hope you know that. So, so long as we're living, we never arrive spiritually. We should always be growing. We should always be moving closer to God in the way in which we live our lives. Well, Enoch's an example for each of us because he lived that godly life in an evil world. And there's only two men in all of history who never died, and the other one is Elijah. Got to tell you, one of the things that I truly love about the Word of God is that it doesn't make the characters, the people in here, out to be superheroes. You've got the Gilgamesh epic, which has to do with the flood from a Babylonian perspective, and its characters are made into superhumans. So often you read these other books that people say should, should have been included in the Bible, and you find out that they, they make people to be superhumans. But what you find in the Bible is real people with real challenges like you and like me. And when they mess up, the Bible doesn't stop from putting it in there. The Bible puts it in there as an example for each and every one of us. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we find Elijah just having his greatest victory. And if you remember the story, he had gotten into it with King Ahab. And, and when he contacted Ahab, he told him to bring the 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets uh, of, of Ashereth. And by the, the way, Ashereth is the female counterpart to the fertility god Baal. And he brings the people together. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 22, it says this. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and he said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if it's Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You see what Elisha does? He brings the people in. They're not following Yahweh. They're not following God. He says, look, you, you guys need to decide who it is that you're going to follow. We've got the same decision to make today, too. We've got two different worldviews out there. We've got the worldview of the world around us. We've got the worldview of the Word of God. And we've got to decide who we're going to follow. We can't live this life walking on both sides of the fence. God's not going to accept that. He wants us to, to make a decision. Are we going to follow him or are we going to follow the world? Well, Elijah believed that he was left alone, the last of the prophets of God. And here he is. He's going to face 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Ashereth. But he was dead wrong. The Bible tells us that there were 7,000 that still hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. Well, Elijah brings everybody in. He tells them he wants them to go ahead and make two different altars to get the wood, to get the, to get the oxen for the sacrifice, to prepare everything, and then they're going to have a competition. And the God in which the fire comes down from heaven, he is the true God. And so Elijah, like a gentleman, goes ahead and he tells the prophets of Baal, I want you to go ahead and go first. So they cut up the, the, the oxen and they put it on the, the, the wood and the prophets of Baal start doing their thing, trying to call God to their God to, to bring down fire from heaven. 
Well, what we need to know is that for the Jews, the morning sacrifice took place at 9 in the morning. The evening sacrifice took place at 3 in the afternoon. Elijah says, go ahead, 9 in the morning. So they're going, they're doing everything that they can do, and nothing is happening. And it comes to the point where it's about noon, halfway through that process. Elijah begins to mock them. Ha! Huh, where is he? Maybe he's falling asleep in the Hebrew. Maybe he had to step out and use the bathroom. And I mean, I mean he, he is just mocking them bad. And so the prophets of Baal, they start whipping themselves. They start cutting themselves. They got blood going all over. They're leaping, jumping up and down, doing everything like crazy until three o'clock. And finally, Elijah says, enough is enough. You've had your turn. Sit down. And he goes and he builds, rebuilds the altar of Israel with 12 uncut stones, just like God had said to do. And they put the wood around, and they get 12 jars, 12 bowls of water that he tells them that he wants them to put the water on. And uh, he starts pouring that up. Now, to get an idea how much water we're talking here, they suspect that it was about, about the, the equivalent of a, what we have for a garbage can today. So 12 garbage can size uh, pottery uh, bowls to, to pour on this. And so they cover it all up with water. And then Elijah comes over and he gets on his knees and he prayed simply and he prayed honestly in the, to the Lord and fire fell from heaven. People say, I don't know how to pray. You want to know how to pray? You pray simply. You pray honestly. You pray right from the heart. Like you're talking to your Father because you are. You're talking to your Heavenly Father if you've put your trust in God. And the people fell on their faces and they cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said, Well then take these prophets of Baal and you take them on down to the valley by the creek and you slaughter them. And they did. Then Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he turned around, got on his knees and he faced the Mediterranean Sea, put his head down and he began praying. You see, Elijah had prayed that the rains would stop and the rains stopped for three and a half years. They were in a major drought. And he prayed and he sent his servant. He said, I want you to go over there and see if you see any clouds coming. Would you run again? Would you see if there's any clouds coming? Six times he runs over there. Would you see if any clouds would come? Well, go back again. The seventh time, the servant comes back. And the servant said, I see a cloud coming that looks like the hand of a man. Elijah said to him, I want you to go to King Ahab. And you tell him to get his chariot ready. And you tell him to get back home before the rains prevent him from getting home. The servant did that. Elijah took his cloak, puts it up. Supernaturally, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he outran the king all the way back to the city. Supernatural, the biggest victory in his life, with the possible exception of when he raised the widow's son. Elijah has this huge victory. But Ahab gets back. We look in, now in, in, uh, in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. Ahab gets back, and he tells his wife Jezebel what had happened. She is ticked. If I don't have Elijah dead by this time tomorrow, you know, she, she's just going absolutely crazy. Let this happen to me. And, and, and so Elijah hears this and he takes off and he begins to run like he's, he's scared and he, he runs in fear of his life. He goes south down to Beersheba, which is in Judah, and he brings his servant with him, but he leaves his servant there on the spot. And he goes a day further. And he finds a juniper tree, which is what you're seeing on the screen there, is a juniper tree in Israel. He finds a juniper tree and it says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and he sat down under the broom tree and he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. I can't take this anymore. Now the Lord, now Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. I wonder why it is that when we have a huge spiritual high in our life, and maybe you've noticed that, there's always a crash that seems to follow. We talk about that at retreats, don't we? We go up to the trees and we say, hey, we've had this mountaintop experience. Now you can expect when you go down below, there's going to be attacks on the kids. There's going to be attacks by your spouse. There's going to be all of these things that are going on. Why? 
Because Satan does not want you to have spiritual victory in your life. And he will do everything that he can do to knock you out of the saddle. He, he wants you to turn your back on God rather than coming to him. Elijah has this huge spiritual victory and now everything's falling apart. Do you know why it's falling apart? We do the same thing. Elijah took his eyes off of God where they'd been in chapter 18 and now he put them on his circumstances. You might be someone here that fights depression. I know there's times I fight depression. And I want you to do a test and I'll guarantee, to guarantee you. When Elijah was on that mountain, he was looking at God. He was, he was looking at the needs of the people. He was challenging them. His, his vision was out. But every time we fall into depression, do you know what happens? Our vision goes from being on God and being on others' needs to being on ourselves and to being on our own situation. When that happens, it puts us in a spiral and we begin to go down. The solution to that is we have got to get our eyes back on God, get our focus back outside on other things and be able to help other people. The weaknesses that we've had in the past, we can take and strengthen them by going out and helping other people. But any time in your life in which you do anything in which you grow spiritually, expect to get whacked. It's going to happen. And in fact, once you realize that, it'll keep all kinds of heartbreak out of your life, out of your marriage, out of everything else. Cheryl and I, we talk quite often. When something great happens and we start seeing a spiritual warfare, here it comes. You know, they're going to do it. And we just got to realize that, well, Elijah was going through spiritual warfare and he was struggling. How did the Lord respond to Elijah's depression? He sent an angel to minister to him. It says, and an angel appeared, awakening him. Arise and eat. Give him water to drink. And he, he did this two times. And this food and this water gave Elijah the strength to make a journey 40 days and 40 nights as far as Mount Horeb, which is, is also called Mount Sinai. And when he arrived there, he took refuge within a cave. Now, being in the Holy Land, I can understand why he looked for a cave. Because when you're out there, it gets hot. And when you go inside a cave, it's nice and cool, maybe 55 degrees or so. And he finds that refuge. He goes into the cave. And for the first time, God asks him, Elijah, what are you doing? And Elijah, rather than humbly bowing down, goes into a self-pity party. Lord! And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in like manner. Now it's important for us to realize that these two witnesses in Revelation 11, whoever they are, end up being killed. In fact, we see the whole world sees and they celebrate for three days that they're dead. They leave their bodies on display. But after three days, suddenly... These two individuals are resurrected and they come back to life. <clears throat> Hang on to that thought for a minute. As we complete verse 6, it says this, These have power to shut up the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood, to strike the earth with all the plagues as often as they desire. So we're wondering, who are these two witnesses? Well, now we get a description of who these individuals are. It says, these have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls. Remember Elijah? Elijah had prayed that the heavens would be shut up. And they were for three and a half years. People say, ah, oh, it must be Elijah. Well, let's look at the other one. It says, and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all the plagues as often as they desire. I want you to think back to the book of Exodus. Who was it in the book of Exodus that had power over the waters to turn them to blood? Moses. Who was it that struck the earth with all kinds of plagues? Moses. It was God working through Moses. So the majority of the people over the years have said, well, that's, that's a picture of Moses. It's a, a picture of Elijah. But why would there be a lot of people who think that those two individuals, you ready for this, were Enoch and Elijah? Why would they think that? Because there's only two people up until this point. We haven't died yet. But there, there's only two people in history who have never died 
but have been caught up to heaven, which may be a picture of us. But this is their argument. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, a change has to take place for you and for me to go to heaven. Something has to happen within our body. There's this radical transformation that takes place. And those people who believe that it's Enoch and Elijah say, well, they ended up dying. Everybody ends up dying. I don't know. I'm going to leave that up to you as to what you decide. I, I lean towards, uh, eventually we're going to see that, that rapture come up. I'm not sure exactly what time. I lean towards the pre-tribulation rapture, but I can't say with all, so I wouldn't bet my life on that. But as we, as we work through the heroes of the faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's encouraging for me, at least, to see real people with real challenges, with real faults. Do you feel unworthy to go to heaven? I mean, I don't know how many times I've spoken to people that say, I, I don't feel worthy to go to heaven. And I'll say to them, well, I've got something I need to say with you. You're not. Do you realize that? That we are not on our own merit worthy to go to heaven. You know, the only way that we can go to heaven is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we find out in the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Would you read this with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That gospel invitation is open to everybody. But we find out, so often we don't continue reading. If we read all the way to the end in John 3.36, we find out a little bit more. Because this is what it says. It says, he who believes in the Son, not will have, but he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. You see, even like in the days of Elijah, Elijah came before the people and he said, look people, you need to choose. Are you going to follow the God of the Bible or are you not going to follow the God of the Bible? And even today, we need to choose. Are we going to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are we going to follow the God of the Bible? Or are we going to follow the ways of the world? Because the Bible says, He who believes the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, please don't let another day go by without doing it. We don't know if we're going to have a tomorrow. Let's just go ahead and pray. And Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus. We look at our lives and realize that we can't be good enough to go to heaven. Lord, we are sinners who need to be saved by grace. And we're so grateful that you sent your sacrifice in Jesus Christ to take our place that we might find forgiveness and new life in him. Lord, if there's anyone here today that's never received Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray they might pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Lord, I have sinned and so messed up my life. Lord, I ask for your help, Lord, that, that you would help me to be the kind of man, woman, boy, or girl that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day I surrender my life to you. I repent. I change direction. And I ask you to come into my heart and life. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. In Jesus, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.